welcome to historic St. James Episcopal Church. If you entered this morning through the red doors, perhaps you noticed that they are dedicated to our benefactor. Those doors were rebuilt and dedicated in 1957, the doors being built by Russell Mintz. I'm told that Russell was a Finnish carpenter who did absolutely beautiful boat and home building on this island. The carvings on the door were done by Ed Campbell. If you also happen to notice in the, in the vestibule coming through that door, there are two plaques designating St. James as both a national and a state historic site. There also is a marker out by the road. The markers in, in the vestibule were dedicated in 1982 in the memory of Ted Barbier. Everything I will tell you this morning is available in print in three books that were written by our island historian, Isabella Swan. The three books are Lisette, The Ark of God, and The Deep Roots. I am Joyce Turin. Our cameramen today are George Stewart and Kurt Chrysler. The history of this chapel really dates to the period surrounding the American Civil War. The history of the island dates more generally to the period surrounding the American Revolution. I'm going to give you just a brief ske sketch on the island history itself as we know it. Certainly it goes far beyond that, but what we are primarily concerned with is the fact that in the 1700s, Cadillac came to this island. He was going to use this as his fort to defend this territory. He was here for a number of years. In 1707, he gave La Grosile, which is this island, the large island, in a group of 14 in the surrounding area to his daughter Magdalene as a gift. In 1711, the royal court said, you cannot give away property of the crown, and the gift was rescinded. Eventually, Cadillac moved upstream, as you well know, to Detroit, to Detroit, to establish a fort that remained for many more years. His reasons for leaving here were twofold. First, he felt very vulnerable to attack, and of course he would have been. He was surrounded by water. And secondly, he thought they might run out of wood, which to us sounds strange, but you have to realize that the wood, the timber was used for the fort, for the buildings, and for fuel. And I suppose that was a perfectly legitimate feeling at that time. The years following 1776, two days after the signing of the Declaration of Independence, in other words, on July 6, this island was purchased from the Potawatomi Indians by two brothers. Those brothers were William and Alexander McComb. Now you would say McComb, and we've named our business district for their, them, that street, I should say, and nobody says McComb, but they did. The original deed to the transaction is available. It's, it's recorded and kept at the uh, Burton Collection of the Detroit Historical Society, uh, Detroit Public Library. The two brothers who purchased this island were unable to do anything about establishing residence here for quite some time. The territory in this area remained in dispute. The French fought, the English fought, the Indians raided. It went on until 1784 when they were finally able to establish farms along this eastern shore. Those farms were all very long, some actually going, some of the early deeds actually running from the eastern shore to the western shore. They were long and narrow, all having water frontage. They were what we would call strip or ribbon farms, and you will find the same sort of thing along the St. Lawrence um, Seaway. It's, it's a way to give everybody water frontage. The water frontage was crucial. I'm sure in the very beginning it was used for both drinking and irrigation until wells were dug, but beyond that it was used for transportation. How do you get to an island? that's surrounded by water if you have no means of getting there without a bridge or any other vehicle. There were no airplanes either. 
That need for transportation will appear again in our story of this chapel in a different way. The years 1847 to 1861 found a home on the site where the large church is today. In that home was the Island Institute for Boys, conducted by the Reverend Moses Hogue Hunter. That school existed until the American Civil War, and that occasion caused a number of the young students to go off as recruits. Eventually, Mr. Hunter himself went off as a chaplain for the Northern cause, and after the war, 1865 and thereon, the school, for some reason, was never reestablished. One of the students from that school, James Biddle, eventually purchased that house and made it his home. And in time, it was sold. It became the island, uh, the island house. It was a hotel. And in 1958, we consecrated or had consecrated a new church on the site. The house was gone by then. I mentioned James Biddle as being one of the students in the class. His brother William also was a student in that school at the time. Their father, Major John Biddle, had come from Philadelphia with his family. He was very prominent in Detroit. He was a president of the Farmers and Mechanics Bank. He purchased 2,000 acres, quite a large parcel of land, for a country estate north of this island on the mainland and he called it Wyandotte. Today, the community up there bears that name. And Jefferson Avenue, as it goes through Wyandotte, carries the Biddle name in respect for that family. In 1831, Mrs. Biddle, she was Eliza Bradish Biddle, took into her employ a woman who was to remain with the family for some three decades. That woman was born Elizabeth Dennison. Sometime prior to 1793, there are no actual records of when she was born. Her parents were Peter and Hannah Dennison, and they were enslaved to a William Tucker family along the Clinton River in Macomb County. And yes, we don't like to admit it, but there were slaves in the North. Mr. Tucker died in 1805. His, upon his death, the Denison parents were to continue as property of Mrs. Tucker so long as she lived and then to be set free. But the children of the Denisons were to be passed along eventually as chattel property to the sons of the Tuckers. Well, of course, the Denisons weren't very happy with this arrangement. The Denison children at this time were not young. They were young adults. Lizette, who had to have been a very feisty individual, went to court and, and attempted to gain her freedom. Now, for somebody in her circumstances at that time to have taken the case to court in itself is outstanding. But unfortunately, Judge Woodward ruled in favor of the Tucker family, and the Denison children were to remain in, in servitude. By means of the Underground Railroad, which we know was merely a series of homes through which people could pass on their way into Canada, the Denison children did manage to escape. By 1816, Lizette's name is again on the records in Detroit. By then, the fugitive slave laws had changed, and she could come back as a freed citizen. Records of Old St. Paul Church in Detroit indicate that she was married in 1827 to a Scipio Forth, F-O-R-T-H. We have reason to believe that Scipio didn't live a great deal longer than 1827, probably another three years, so that it was a widowed Elizabeth Denison Forth who came into the employ of the Biddle family. She was affectionately called Lizette. Mrs. Biddle died in November of 1865, and shortly after, on August 7th of 1866, Lizette died in her own little home in Detroit. She left a final will, leaving two nieces and nephews, she had no children of her own, all of her material goods. 
the residue of the estate she put in the care of William Biddle, whom she called her Willie. She had watched him grow from childhood to, to a young attorney and asked that that sum, which was somewhere around $1,500, be used for the establishment of a fine chapel for use of the Protestant Episcopal Church, of which I am a communicant, she said. Out of respect <clears throat> for their mother's long-standing friendship with this woman, and although Mrs. Biddle and Lisette were worlds apart, by matter of birth and social standing, they had a relationship and a, and a kindly friendship that did last many, many years. The Biddle sons decided they would pursue this final request. How did Lisette get $1,500? Once she became an employee, she worked for some other families before she came to the Biddles. But you must remember she had the very good advice of this banker president and eventually of the attorney, William Biddle. So she was able to purchase land and houses, rent houses, sell property. At one time, she owned 48 acres of land in Pontiac. Today, there is a cemetery on that site, Oak Hill Cemetery. Lisette also was very outspoken. I told you she was a feisty individual. Just by going to court, you would get that impression. She let people know her feelings. And although it's very likely that she came down here to visit when Mrs. Biddle came to see the sons in school, and we know that she came down here later in her life to, to assist William Biddle and his wife, Susan Dayton Ogden Biddle, with their family, and we know that she went faithfully to church, but she also was not very pleased with the means by which you got to church. <clears throat> 